Welcome to Tulsa Titans, highlighting our local business leaders who are making a difference. Today, we got Brian Martin with Luxa Enterprises. Brian, how are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? I'm great. We appreciate you giving your time. Can you just get us started and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, I'm the uh, head of the HR group. Uh, Luxa is a, an outsourcing provider. We provide virtual back office support in the areas of HR, accounting, and payroll. And uh, I've been with the company for about nine years. And, you know, we just, we have been growing like crazy over the last few years. It's been, it's been awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm former military, retired out of the Air Force and, you know, big, big family guy and uh, got two dogs and uh, three daughters and I think they're all females and you know that's why I have no hair so <laughs> you are outnumbered that's right <laughs> well I want to get to some of the things that drive you and in, in some of the leadership um, points that we constantly talk about but before we started recording you and I were talking about something really interesting uh, and I know people are reading there's there's a possibility of five generations in the workplace where you're at uh, they think differently. They value things differently. Uh, how are you helping companies solve that? What's that look like? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just helping educate these different generational groups um, just about, you know, what makes each generation unique? Uh, what are the, the, the different things that uh, generation C as important versus maybe things that are more flexible, because if you look at each generation, what you see is, you know, traditionals, the, the mantra was always kind of live to work and everything was done individually. And uh, they, they really didn't want to hear from, from anyone in terms of their feedback. And so you, you kind of throw that in with some of the newer generations, the millennials and Gen Zs who've kind of entered the workforce and it's, it's kind of the opposite where, you know, they, they need more feedback than just once a year. They, they, they only work in order to really just kind of carry out what, what they want to do in their lives. So it's, it's a completely different mantra. I would say that the, the key thing there for us is just educating those groups, you know, whether it be a key leader or just someone in a, in a department who is surrounded by different generations Okay, why why do they behave like that? Why do they think that way? Uh, and how do we kind of get those groups to work together? And I think a lot of times just the knowledge of knowing, oh, okay, well, you know, traditionalists they think like this, or baby boomers or Gen Xers they think this way, and that helps me to frame up my conversation and how I interact with a person. And so I think that's really. I think that's just the first step is is really kind of getting the groups uh, to understand each other's differences, kind of like personality assessments. So you do those and, you know, once you know why someone behaves the way they do, then it makes it a lot easier for you to go to them and, and have uh, positive communication. Yeah, and, and you made a great point. You said a lot of professionals will kind of put this on the younger generation, but not look back and see the fact that their their household and even their school system was completely different than than ours right and so it's really the framing of their entire life that we're working against but we're, we're pinpointing it as it's the individual when it's not I thought that was really interesting yeah I mean it it, it wasn't very long ago and of course uh, I lived through this kind of transition being a Gen Xer but it wasn't that long ago that we didn't have computers or cell phones or technology uh, the fact that we're recording this on a webcast uh, would have never existed you know 30 years ago so it's it's very interesting you know when I got out of high school there was no cell phones you know uh, personal computers were, were not really a thing and so you know we have folks that are entering the workforce millennials gen, gen z and they are they are digital natives. You know, they grew up with all of those things. And so that's just part of how they how they do work. And so, you know, you, you get a lot of um, maybe baby boomers or Gen Xers who are, are proficient with technology, but they're not savvy. And so sometimes there's a little bit of frustration there, you know, and maybe um, sometimes that bleeds over into the interactions that you have with with these other groups because you you don't understand what what they know because you just you didn't you weren't raised in that environment and so it's it's uh, 
it's it's a very unique time in our period when we've had more technological advances than any time in our history. Uh, and we have five generations in the workplace. And it's like, okay, <laughs> we we've we've got all these folks at the party table, and it's almost like they speak five different languages. And so how are we going to um, get some Google Translate in here so that we can <laughs> help them to understand each other? Well, and for those just coming into the workforce and they've got kind of a, a senior executive team, they've been in the workforce, you know, from the time that there was pen and paper and no computer, what would you tell younger professionals about those older executives? What's the trend there for them to understand? Well, you know, again, it's it's helping them to understand that uh, there might be a, a specific process or a way of doing things that has lasted uh, for 20 or 30 years that's been very successful for a business. And so, you know, my advice to those folks is always be patient, number one, because don't think that, well, just because you may know of a better way technologically or there's some other way to do it that you feel or have seen or experienced that is better, that you're going to run into an organization that is full of, of maybe baby boomers and Gen Xers and leadership roles and just make them change it. So I think it's very, you know, that, that that's really the big part of communication that we have with those folks as they come into the workplaces you know, these companies have existed and they have been successful in what they have been doing. And so it's not that you are, are going to go in and just say, yeah, that doesn't work or I have a better way and that they're just going to stop what they're doing and say, sure, let's adopt that. So it's it's being patient, proving that you, number one, can do a good job and, and be productive and be uh, integrated into the culture. And then once once that happens, as you begin to move up into the organization and uh, and your career ladder, those opportunities will present itself to make some changes, and you can start to maybe mold the organization to more of a futuristic state. Oh, that's great information. I hope everybody kind of eats up and and continues to think through it. And the way I would anchor it, because I've worked with all of them, I've got a. Uh, business partner uh, who's a boomer and then I've got uh, see I'm some much much younger professionals I'm kind of in the middle is if we can slow down and take a genuine interest in every person and really find out what makes them tick it's a lot easier to to lead grow and manage them and then then I think the the fun part is getting the youngest person to communicate with the oldest person I still haven't yeah. figured that one out yet well, there's a, a really cool personality test called the five minute personality test that you can find online. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It literally does take five minutes, um, but it will give you uh, surprisingly. It's kind of based on loosely on the four temperaments, uh, but it will give you kind of a, uh, a sense of who you are uh, in relation to those four temperaments and why you behave the way you behave, the things that are kind of pros and maybe some constructive things about your personality. And I've had I've had a client who actually took that a step further. They they bought everyone a stuffed animal of that particular animal because it, when you take the test, it, it will tell you what animal you are. And, uh, and, and that way, if anyone entered their office, they could see that they were a lion or they were a beaver or they were a golden retriever. Um, and, and they could adjust accordingly because some people need things to be framed a certain way. Uh, in order to receive it, and other people need it framed completely different. So we can't we can't apply a one uh, size fits all approach to communication in the workplace, and and then you start adding generational differences into that, and it becomes even more complex. So you know, as as much as I would love to tell clients, well, you can just keep doing what you're doing, and and just tell people when they come to work for you that if if they don't like it, they can leave. They really probably won't have anyone working for them if they continue to do that. So, you know, the thing is about education and communication and getting those groups uh, to the table together uh, to, to figure out what works best for each organization. Because, again, there's no one size fits all, even for organizations when it comes to communications, jobs, responsibilities, uh, those types of things. 
Well, I want to pivot just a little bit back just slowly on you. Um, you know, you and I were talking about presenting on Zoom and just this this tech push, but also during COVID being at home a lot. Um, so with our environments changing, are there some things that you took a step back and looked at and kind of took time away from? And then there are other things that you said, hey, these are more important in my life. What's that look like for you? Yeah, well, I would say from a work perspective, you know, we shut down for about seven months during COVID. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we are in a business that we, as long as we have laptops, we can we can work virtually just about anywhere. So it made it really easy for us to transition. Uh, what we didn't really anticipate or think about too much was our culture and how are we going to keep our culture intact? Because you know, we've Lexus, you know, we've been fortunate to to put the right people in the right places over the years. And I've been there almost 10 years. And, uh, you know, this year we won the best places to work for the Journal Record Company of Oklahoma. Uh, we finished first in that that competition. And it's all based on employee surveys. So they send a survey out to the employees about, you know, uh, a myriad of topics. And we ended up being first. And so I think it speaks volumes to our culture. And so when we go home and we're all working from home and we're no longer together in the office for seven months, you know, how, do, how do you stay connected? How do you continue to grow your culture, to build your teams? And so we had to really kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, what, what, what's working in its current state, uh, being that we're, we're working remotely, and what's not working? And, and kind of doing this um, this kind of act, after action review uh, of uh, the things that were working and not working and then say, okay, maybe maybe we need to do some things differently in order to keep our culture intact to, to maintain uh, all the great things that we have going on at Luxa. Uh, and what does that look like? And so, you know, we didn't just as a leadership team decide to do that outside of the rest of the group, we got everybody together involved in that conversation. And it was like, okay, well, one of the things that we, we that came out of that discussion was people didn't want to come back full time. Like, like they just didn't. And so we're kind of left with this decision as a leadership team of, well, are we going to allow that to happen? Or are we going to have to really kind of scrutinize the way we've been operating? Because we, you know, once you prove that it works, right? So we're we're home for seven months. We didn't we didn't miss any business. We didn't lose business. I mean, we kept right on moving. And so, you know, it's not like your employees don't see that. They see your success in that environment. And then, so what would be the reason? What's the reason that you would give? that group of people, well, we're going to go back in the office. And so so what, what what's funny about that conversation is the folks who are closer to boomers in my leadership team were, were the ones saying, yeah, we need them back in the office, <laughs> right? Because they need to see them working. And uh and and you know the question the questions came about like, well, how do you know that they're doing their job? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, is that a people problem or is that a management problem? So if I give you a job to do and you're doing it because no one's complaining about it, I'm not getting phone calls, no one's no one's telling me otherwise, uh, how, how could I then say you're not doing your job? I mean, isn't the proof kind of in the pudding of, hey, you know, uh, I have an expectation and if you want to work from home, that's fine. You know, here's the hours I'm going to need you to be available for clients. Uh, these are the things in your job duties I need you to do. And outside of that, you do what you want. And and so the reality is I'm going to hold them to the expectations. I'm not going to hold them to some higher level of uh, uh, workplace uh, procedure or policy just because in the past we all worked here in the office and I could see them work. I knew they were here. And so, you know, fast forwarding to the end of the pandemic, uh, so to speak, and kind of people trying to get back to normal. 
we had we had hard, real hard decisions to make because we had a we had an office that would hold all of our staff. We had uh, folks that had, you know, been very upfront and honest with us, which we asked for about the fact that they didn't want to come back to the office. We had a, a proven way of doing it uh, virtually because the last seven months proved to us we could do it. And so, you know, we got this big space. What are we going to do with this? So, you know, we had to make a lot of really tough decisions uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and, you know, what, what came out of it was about 60% of our workforce is working from home full time now. We sold our, our office and we moved to a smaller space to accommodate just the folks like myself who want to be in the office. And we've been doing that now for over a year and it works. I mean, I sent out a survey to our clients because of course we're an outsourcer. So I sent a survey out to tell me how we're doing, you know, at the end of last year. And everybody was like, you're doing great. So, you know, I mean, it's it's been very interesting because uh, we have some, we, we probably have four of those five generations in our workplace. And I would say that uh, it's, it's not generational in terms of who wants to work from home or not. It's totally not generational because I have some millennials who are working from home full time who, who wanted to do it. I also have some in the office full time who wanted to do it. And, you know, so, so, you know, when I talk to clients, a lot of times like, well, millennials just want to work from home. And, well, no, they don't. We don't want to put people in boxes, obviously. But, you know, what I see, what I've experienced is, is every generation is different in terms of what they, what works for them, what makes sense for them, how they become more productive. And, uh, you know, as a business, the thing that's most important to us is obviously we want to make money. You know, we're a for-profit industry. We want to we want to make money. But how do we do that, you know? Well, we stay connected, even though 60% of our workforce is working from home. We stay connected by doing quarterly community service. We stay connected by having fun Fridays once a quarter. Uh, occasionally, we'll have like a, a movie or something we'll show at work. Um, we're big in the United Way. And so every chance we get to get together, we we do that. But we also use technology such as Zoom or um, Teams or um, we have Ring Central for our phone and so we can message that way. And so, you know, we have people that uh, just take it upon themselves independently who took the initiative to say, I'm going to send out a, a good morning to everyone on, on uh, Ring Central every day. And so... You know, there are people that if that doesn't happen now, they're they're like, where's the where's the message for the day, right? And so it's 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 amazing to see the transformation that we've had because again, we were very traditionally mindseted. We were in the workplace from eight to five, five days a week, and just like most most companies who uh, do similar things, professional services, five days a week we were all in the office, and now sixty percent of our workforce is working from home full time. I don't know if they're home or they're, you know, on vacation, but they're working. I, I have no idea, but that's not what's important. The important thing is they're meeting the expectations and I, I'm going to manage to that. That was a lot. I know. But. No, and it's great. Well, it's, it's an important topic for where we're at. We uh, went completely uh, remote. I think there was a, a time too. And, and with what we do, and, and you know, this, you're a small business. You know, one of the things people kind of get mad at the word COVID, like, listen, if you get your entire staff sick at the same time, you're in trouble. Yeah. Like, you know, you just are, you can't service your clients. And so we disperse some stuff. And uh, interestingly enough, what I think that I've noticed a trend in is personality types, certain personality types thrive at home and others, um, they lose something, right? They need a little more human interaction. It's how God made them. And so um, for our sales team, we were missing some some details. And so our collab time's got to be in the office because you've got a bunch of high running extroverts that are not yeah. detail oriented. And so uh, there, but our service team, like we have a, a real tight culture, like you said too. And what we were losing in the office is 
those guys want to work. And a couple of our girls, they want to work and they were distracting each other because they're highly introverted, but they all like the same things. And so the new Star Wars movie comes out and they all lose hours, right? And, they're here. <laughs> and so now they sleep more, they spend less on gas and they get their work done and they all, they actually all love chatting more than they actually like opening their mouth anyway. And so <laughs> the chat channel, so it's been really good. And the other really cool thing about it is it forced us to update our handbook and write all of our onboarding and offboarding processes around hybrid work and work from home. And so we had uh, one of our most valued people, she had a crisis in her family and she needed to go to Colorado for extended period of time. So she just went to Colorado and was working the next day and nobody ever knew. And we have uh, client facing feedback and internal feedback with well, internal feedback. She got the award client facing feedback and she hadn't been here in six months. Right. And I go to the right. people asked about her. I was like, Oh, she's doing great in Colorado. She's in Colorado. I'm like, yeah. You know, yeah. And I think we have to be mindful too, for those, you said a really, a really important statement earlier for the boomers. Um, and I'm just going to call them out. It's what I hear from the most in our industry. We've always done it this way. Well, everything's changing faster than it ever has. You're going to have competition from other States and they're going to start grabbing people in Oklahoma because they don't have to pay them as much and they're kind and they communicate pretty well. And so if you are not making those changes you'll be without a workforce because they're going to get compensated better from people that aren't even here. Well, yeah, because they will uh, pay them to work from home so they can live in Oklahoma and get paid, you know, twice the wage because, you know, a company in Washington, ZZ, as an example, no longer has to pay the living wage there. They can, they can pay a much lower living wage in Oklahoma and get their uh, staff from all over the country. And, you know, they're, they're saving lots of money doing that. When Brian, you said you, you brought up management, but you were talking about manage the expectation of the role, not, not a time frame, right? Are they, are they getting their job done? Are they hitting the, the marks? Um, for you, what helps you continue to be effective at that? Do you have like a daily ritual, something you do every week that, that kind of helps set you up for success? Well, I would say me personally uh, you know i'm i'm a gen xer who likes to be in the office i like to work here um, i definitely have an entire team of hr and payroll people who like to work from home uh, about half of my group is millennial and the other half is gen xer uh, and i would say you know for me i have to i have to kind of stay in communication with them on a regular basis in order to kind of feel like I'm being effective as a leader. So we have, you know, we have a kind of a mandatory call. Uh, we do a virtual and an in-person HR meeting every other week. So one week it's virtual, one week it's in the, in the office. Um, I think that really helps me more than it does them. Because I get to see them, number one, and I get to kind of hear what they're doing and talk about what they're doing. Because they, you know, they're really good about contacting me if they have an issue or something or they want to escalate something or I need to help them. But this, the meeting that I have with them is really just designed to, to, to ask about how they're doing, to find out how they're doing. Um, and I think that helps me be more effective. Um, it, as I said, I don't, I don't know if you're a person that likes to work from home, then you may not need as much social interaction as I do. Whereas, you know, a lot of HR people are people, people. And so I need, I need to be around people <laughs> or else I get, or else I get really, uh, distracted. So, you know, I, I, I was a guy who, when we started working in the office for that seven month period, that was kind of going stir crazy at home. And I was like, I can't, I, I need to separate the two. I need to separate work from home. And even though it, I may have an office, I can't, I can't separate the two. So I get distracted too easily. So yeah, I think, me, that, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I think that's really important. So I got depressed, but I didn't know it. I had my first in-person meeting back and like felt like I was soaring and I felt something come back. And, and I realized in that moment that me separating myself via a screen for too long for what I needed personally was toxic. And I knew my team needed it, right? Still a majority of our team needs that. They function better on a screen. It's how God made them, not me. And so it's, it's a balance. One, like you said, you can't say I've always done it this way and be a selfish leader. 
but um, just like your role in a in a family, like you can't do for everybody else and run completely out. Just like on a plane, you put your mask on first, right? You've got to realize what that mask is for you so you can give your team your best. And so I like that you bring everybody in because it fuels you for what you need. Because we, we can't overlook that either. Yeah, I mean, uh, selfishly, maybe I, I do it for me, but uh, I don't think the team minds. I think they're they're more than happy to come in once every other week and just, uh, you know, get together and talk about clients and, and any anything going on in our lives. We kind of do like this little round table discussion when we first start our meeting and it's kind of like we call it wows and pows so you know t tell me your wows and pals tell me you know what, what's what's been good and what's what's maybe a pal for you uh over the last couple of weeks and you know i think even people that work from home and are and are, are completely comfortable in that environment i think that's a great environment for them to kind of let let some of that stuff go too because you know what? What we what we have found, as you said, is there was a lot of people who suffered from some mental distress during COVID, and even people who were really good in, in that environment still suffered to some degree um, just from the environment of being kind of isolated. You know, as a human species in general, psychologically we need we need some type of uh, interaction with other humans. And so we can, we can't lose sight of that, even though people may be really good at working from home, it doesn't mean that you don't need to make them occasionally get together because that's going to be a relief for them psychologically. They may not even know it. It could be subconscious, but it's going to help them. Um, and so that, I think that's super important. I think, you know, getting together, not just for the sake of getting together, but really asking the question, what, what's been going on with you? Give me some wows and pals is I think just crucial to maintaining a culture, a relationship and, and whether you like it or not, you spend a, a lot of your working life doing work. And whether that's working at home or that's working here in the office, this is, this is your other family. This is your other family that, uh, that you're going to spend a lot of time with and whether you're doing that virtually or in person, it doesn't really matter. You're still spending a lot of time with these folks. And so you need to know how they're doing that. They're, they are your work family. So I think it's super important and it's something that we, we continue to do. And I've never had pushback from anyone on my team on doing it because I think they enjoy it too, but it does selfishly, it does help me. That's a, a really, really good point, and it's super important for where we're at. So I'm connected uh, here in Tulsa with a lot of the counseling organizations, and they don't they don't have enough counselors. They haven't shrank. They just there's that many people that are not okay right now, which means that in all of our companies there's somebody that's not okay. Um, so let's let's dig into that just a little bit more, Brian. You bring everybody mm -hmm. together. What are a couple of things that you do from a leadership role to be like? I need to kind of figure out like, are you really okay? Yeah, well, I think I think a couple things. I think uh, there there is a, a bit of of what the relationship looks like that that kind of helps drive what what you do in terms of making sure people really are okay. But you know, I would I would back up a little bit and say that if if you're a good leader or manager uh, in an organization, you have probably worked really hard at building relationships because uh, we know through lots of studies and years and years of looking at this stuff that uh, when people are happy, when they, um, when they have good relationships at work, they're more productive, they um, stay longer, um, they are more apt to take leadership roles in the future. Um, so, you know, that there's, there's good studies and statistics to kind of go behind us and say that leaders should spend a lot of their time and energy on relationships first. And, and hopefully if you've done that, then it's really simple for you to then have open and candid conversations with people about how are you really doing, you know? And, and if I ask that to someone who I don't have a good relationship with uh, in the office or on my team, the answer most likely is not going to be at least a complete 
admission of what's going on with the person it's going to be partial you know they might i mean it's, it's just like when you go to church and you and everybody says how are you doing and everybody says the same thing they all say oh fine you know i'm perfect and you know unless you really have a good relationship with that person it's likely that that's all you're ever going to hear so i think i think the key there is kind of again stepping back and saying well what's your relationships look like because I, I go about the business each and every day of building, continuing to build relationships with my team. And, and I've been working with, uh, with two of them for over 10 years and it doesn't matter. I still have to work on it. You know, it's just like a marriage. It's just like a family. You've got to continually work on that relationship all the time. And so I spend a lot of time relationship building so that I can, if I, if I, if I, I know that if I ask the question, how are you really doing? then I'm probably going to get an, an honest answer because of the relationship that I've built. Um, but, you know, outside of that, of course, we do, uh, we try to do some wellness activities where we'll have like, sometimes we'll have maybe therapists come in uh, and talk to people about uh, things that we don't probably spend enough time talking about, which is like the mental health side of things. Um, you know, it's, it almost seems like if you can't see mental illness, then it doesn't exist, right? So, hey, I can't see that you're depressed. I can't see that you're sad or you're unhappy or something's going on in your personal life that's making you behave a certain way. I can't see it because every time I see you, it seems like you're doing fine. And I don't think we spend enough time educating people about, hey, you know, it's okay to not be okay. It's it's really okay to not be okay. And and you have resources. You know, we use things like EAP. Obviously, a lot of companies have things like that, resources available to them. But I but I I still think you have to go back to the beginning, which is if you don't have a good relationship with people, they're not gonna talk to you and you're not gonna know and you're gonna spend a lot of time and energy. <clears throat> maybe managing a person out of an organization who, if you had a good relationship with them, uh, you could have saved them in the organization. So. Well, and Brian, one more question, just kind of wrap up. Um, you know, I'm a big reader and and I just love that some people put their entire life's work into a book, right? And we get a lot from them. Are there are a couple of books that you'd recommend or that you would dive back into and why? Yeah, that's a great question. So, <clears throat> One of my other jobs, you know, I'm a former military. I'm also an adjunct professor um, at a local university here in Tulsa. And one of the classes that I teach is uh, it's kind of an HR management course, but it's kind of taken from the lens of uh, servant leadership. And so there's a book by Robert Greenleaf. It's just called Servant Leadership. He, he's written actually uh, quite a few books on this topic, but it's really coming at leadership from a servant's perspective. It's also a little bit of Christian focus. Um, but I would say that it's it's probably one of my favorites because there are so many leaders out there who think that the key to effective, uh, being effective as a leader is telling people what to do you know, and then watching them do it. Uh, you know, you, you you work really hard and you reach a certain place in your career where you're finally managing uh, big groups of people or a function or something really important. And all of a sudden you think that the best way to go about that is just, you know, tell people what to do and sit back and watch. And you know, servant leadership is all about serving first. So, you know, when I when I manage my team, the question I'm constantly asking them is, what can I do for you? How can I help you be more successful? Because uh, if if you know if you're a Christian and you believe in and uh, those things, uh, we know that Jesus was a servant first, and you know, it's almost like 
you know, I, that that's a model that I want to follow. I want to I want to take that model of being a servant first and serve others so that then I can take at least some of the credit for having a great product or having a great service or being super successful um, because I was part of that solution rather than, hey, I was a boss and I, I made it happen. Well, I don't, I don't make anything happen. I serve people in a way that helps them to be the best that they can be and do their best jobs. And that's what makes me successful, not the fact that I it worked really hard that I made it to this head of HR or whatever. That, that's not what does it for me. It, and that book by Robert Greenleaf, uh, Servant Leadership, would be, uh, it's a great read. It's really easy. I think it's like 25 bucks on Amazon. And um, I've had clients that bought that book for every one of their managers in their organization just because they felt like, yeah, this, this, this makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. You know, you if if you're a parent, if if you have any familial relationships, then you know serving your children is also a key to having a great family. You know, I don't tell my kids what to do. You know, I ask them how I can help them be successful. You know, what can I do to help you be successful? Well, maybe that's taking them to soccer practice, or maybe that's helping them understand how to do algebra. But that's me serving. And so we can we can take that same application and move it into the workforce and say, well, that's how I'm gonna that's how I'm gonna lead. That's how I'm gonna interact with my team and the people around me is by serving first. Uh, you'd be surprised how, how well that works. Um, and, then, and then the other one I would say is uh, the five dysfunctions of a team is a great great book. A lot of people have read that one, um, but I like the book because it's. It's all about, and it, it's Patrick Lencioni, uh, and it's all about, it's, it's told from the perspective of, a, of kind of a story. So it's a story versus a lot of leadership books or management books that are just kind of how-tos. and They don't really come at it from a lens of a real-world example, but this is more of a real-world scenario that kind of walks you through a change that happened at the sea level in an organization and then, you know, what happened thereafter? You know, how, how did this new person, this outsider, become uh, a good CEO to his direct reports uh, over time? Um, so th those would be a couple I would recommend. No, that's excellent. And Brian, if anybody listens to this and they want to get a hold of you, do you have a preferred method to kind of communicate email? Yeah, so my email is real simple. It's just B Martin at luxa.us that's uh l-u-x-a.us so very simple thank you everybody thanks this is kellen with new wave solutions brian thank you for giving today thank you